Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And here, Alice and I, and all of the people involved in Bible Talk, want to greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we continue on now in our study of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, um, we had kind of a, a, a buy for the past two weeks while we did special ones related to the coronavirus out, uh, outbreak. Mm -hmm. So we're going to pick up now, and this is the 18th part of our study in that letter to the Ephesians. And we're going to start that right now after Alice prays and asks God's blessing on our time together. Hallelujah. Father, we do. We come before you with humble hearts, and we thank you and we praise you for all that you're doing, Lord. We trust in you, and we know, Lord, that you cause all things to work together for good to those who love you and to those who are called according to your purpose. And Lord, we ask that this word would be opened up to our hearts and our we would be able to share it with others, and that others that would listen to this would hear your voice. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. Yeah, by the way, you know, Paul wrote to Timothy and said that what he had, what Paul was giving to him, he should pass on to others. What God speaks to you, and I mean, not just here, mm. but you should share with others. You are ambassadors for Christ also, okay? Thank you, Lord. All right, so this, this study is going to be entitled uh, family life in the household of God, which I said I've been wanting to do because I don't want to sound judgmental, but by and large, I see this household of God somewhat out of order. And I'm going to use that term probably a few times during this study, out of order. Kind of think of it as you go to a, a, a phone or something and there's a big sign on it that says out of order. It means it's broke and it's not usable, right? It has to be fixed. It has to be fixed. Yes. So that's what we're looking at. God's word is what he uses to repair the things that are wrong. That's right. All right. I prayed, didn't I? Oh, I did. Alice prayed. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. This study is very uh, a very important topic. And the only logical place to start is in the beginning. As always, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1. Mm -hmm. That's always a good place to begin, is at the beginning. You know, and, and as we well know, God made everything for its purpose. He has a purpose in everything he does. That's what it says in Proverbs 16.4. The purpose of making the earth, that creation, was this. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens... He is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. Isaiah 45, 18. God created the earth to be inhabited by man. So then, in good order, after creating the earth and preparing it, it says in Genesis 1, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Genesis 1, 27, as I said. Mm -hmm. Now, by the way, as an aside, if you don't think that order is important, imagine for a moment if God had in his creation account, right? Mm -hmm. If he had created man before he created the sun and the dry land. Right now, we'd all be swimming around in the darkness. I mean, the order matters in things, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, yes. So, but we're not in the darkness because, praise God, the light has come, all right? Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life, John 8, 12. We don't want to be in darkness. You know, Isaiah spoke and said, darkness covers the earth and deep darkness to people. Jesus is our light. He's the light of the world. So we need to be enlightened. And he uses his word. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. All right? Those who follow him, who believe in him, who obey him, that is the church. Or more correctly, they are the family of God. Right? Mm -hmm. So before we get back to the all-important teaching in Ephesians, let's just look, let's just look at the, kind of the basics and, and the context here. In John 3.16, which I'm sure you all know, it says, For God, 
and we're talking about the Father there, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And then in John 3, 6, and 7, he says, But that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. That's your entry into the family, into the family of God. Okay? And only through being born again. That's the only way you can become part of the family of God. The gift of Jesus and his atoning work on the cross. I mean, this is basic, but it's so important. And Jesus said, you must be you, born. You must be born. You say you can. No, you must. You must. Because otherwise you have not life. That's all right. right. So you don't become part of the family of God by joining a church. Now, listen to what I'm saying and think about it. You become part of the church by being born into the family. Mm, that's right. Okay. I mean, the church seems to have that upside down and backwards so much today. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. That's what it says, right? For you have not received the spirit of slavery, leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Romans 8, 14 through 16. I'll say it again and probably not for the last time in this study. Being part of a family is based on your relationship with the Father, and only made possible by his son's sacrifice at the cross. And that is given evidence of by the Holy Spirit and doing the will of the Father. That's, that's how you know, okay? Not because you have a baptismal certificate or because you go to this church or that building every week, but because the Spirit of God bears witness to it and you do the will of the Father. You know, Jesus, I know we've talked about this verse in past studies, but I'm going to talk about it again now. In Matthew chapter 12, starting at verse 47, it says, Someone said to him, to Jesus, Behold, your mother and brothers are standing outside seeking to speak to you. But Jesus answered the one who was telling him and said, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. It's a family affair. It's a life-changing event. And it comes about and it's evidenced by doing the will of the Father. It's not a religious ceremony. So when you're born again and you become part of that family, you are a new creation. You're not the old thing. You're the new creation. That's why it says Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Why? He said that he would build his church. That's why. He's building his church out of living stones. People have asked me, you know, as, I, as we have traveled all over, people will typically, I mean, it's a common thing for them to ask me what church I belong to. What church do you belong to? I've had a, a very consistent answer for a long, long time. I don't belong to a church. I don't belong to a church. I am the church. I belong to the Lord. I was purchased with a price. So let's talk about his good order. His good, good order is a major factor in his family and in all that he does. Therefore, having left off in our last study in Ephesians in chapter 5, verse 20, let's recap from this letter a bit to establish the context as we will then start today in chapter 5, verse 21. Okay, but first, let's get the context. You always have to, you know, it's very important to rightly divide the word. In Ephesians 1.20, I'm going to read from this letter to the Ephesians, different places. In Ephesians verse 1, chapter 1, verse 20 and 22, through 22, he said that he, the Father, worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but above every name that is named 
also in the age to come, also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him, Jesus, as head over all things to the church. All right? So let's start with that. In the beginning of this letter, he establishes the fact that Jesus is the head of the church. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. That's Ephesians 3.12. So we have access to God the Father through Jesus Christ. And he goes on in, ver in chapter 2, verse 18, he says, For through him we have both access in one spirit to the Father. And then in Ephesians 4, chapter 4, verse 4 through 6, he says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. At one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. And then in our last chapter, in our last study, in the fifth chapter, verse, I'm going to read verse 20 again. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. You're going to have to bear that in mind. Yes. Always giving thanks. That's for, a, Yeah, for all things. For all things. Yeah. You know, in, in uh, first, second Thess first Thessalonians, he said that we're to give thanks in all things. But here it says we're to give thanks for all things, okay? We're to be a people of thanksgiving. So I'm going to read chapter 5, verse 21 now. Submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of Christ. The King James says God. Other translations say Christ. You know what? If you're, if you're submitted to one, you're going to be submitted to the others. Submitting yourselves. What does that mean? The dictionary says that submission means to yield oneself to the power or authority of another. In other words, you're recognizing the authority of Jesus Christ and submitting to that, putting yourself under that. The word submit comes, it's derived from a Latin word, submittere, which means to lower or reduce or to yield. Right? The lower. That's important, right? The word submit means to lower, reduce, or yield. The Latin verb is composed of two parts. The first part is sub, which means under, right? Mm -hmm. And then the second part is materi, a verb meaning to send or, or with a sense of letting something go. What do you have to let go? you got to let you go. That's right. You've got to surrender you're, yourself. You're control. You have to surrender your control. That's what it means to submit. That's true, and how the word defines it. That's how the word, the, the world rather, defines submitting, right? Mm -hmm. But we know, I, I pray you know, we know that Scripture interprets Scripture. So let me give you the good description of what it means to submit. Listen to the words, the instruction of Jesus, who is the word. Mm -hmm. When he said, Father, he's facing the cross. Mm -hmm. If you are willing, remove this cup from me. Take it, don't you have to go through. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Luke twenty two forty two. 42. He, he was in submission. He was putting his will under the will of God the Father. He was surrendering his will. Mm -hmm. You don't submit to what you agree with. No. <laughs> You're not submitting. If you agree, if Alice says to me, let's go out and have some pizza. Pizza. <laughs> you know what? I'm not going to have to submit to that. I'll agree with it. All right? If Alice says to me, I'm cooking you Brussels sprouts tonight, well, I don't know if I'm supposed to submit to Alice. No, you don't submit. It's the other way around. So if Alice says we're having Brussels sprouts and I said I'd much rather have pizza, she'd have to submit her will that's under mine. Right. That's right. But submitting means that you're literally you're doing something that you don't want to do. It's not it's not what would normally be your will. You're surrendering your will, you're putting your will under somebody else's will. You've got to understand that. Okay. And by the way, submitting is an issue of faith. You know that? Yes. I, I just wanted to go back to it because I think you had it a little backwards. But <laughs> but the fact <clears throat> that you use the Brussels sprouts, which we know is good for you, 
that would be, I mean, that would be not submitting to me, but you would just be agreeing with me then to have it. There wouldn't be submission there. For me to eat the Brussels sprouts, I'd have to submit. <laughs> so that's another story. But you know, the, the point is, when you sit, if, if somebody says to you, oh, let's go do this, and that's what you want to do, you're not submitting. You know, if, if I say to Alice, I'm going to let's go do this and that, and that's something she really desires to do, she doesn't have to submit. No, I'm in agreement with you. She's in agreement. But if I don't want to do it. Jesus said, I, if this cup could pass for me, let it pass. He didn't, you think he had a, a natural desire to go to the cross? Not a natural desire no, at all. No. But he submitted to the will of the Father. That's what he said. That's, that was always his life. Matthew 8, I'm going to read verses, starting in verse 5, all right? When Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, imploring him, and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, Truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. The centurion was talking about authority. authority. Yes. He was talking about authority. And he says, first of all, that he was submitted to it. He was a man under authority. So he understood. Now, you know what? When you're faithful in what God entrusts you with, he'll, he'll give you more. So that man, he was entrusted with authority, right? Mm -hmm. So it's an issue of faith. That was the greatest faith he found. You know, do you recognize the fact that that he, the centurion recognized it when he said that I also am a man under. He was recognizing the fact, he recognized that Jesus was a man under authority. Right. We'll talk about that. And not only is it a, a matter of faith, and by the way, I mean, it's also an issue of humility. Because in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5, it says this, Have this mind or this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So it's a matter of faith, it's a matter of humility. And it says, submitting yourself one to another, right? Mm -hmm. One to another. Now, this is, you need to understand this before we get into what Paul is writing here in the rest of this letter. Because in Romans chapter 12, verse 10, Paul wrote, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Right? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're more concerned with doing what somebody else wants than what you want. Peter wrote, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. And by the way, it's an issue of authority. Well, we saw that with the centurion. Think of that centurion in his great faith, because he was a man who understood authority. Before he spoke of the authority that he had, he confessed that he was under authority. And a point that's often overlooked, as I just mentioned, he understood that Jesus was under authority. Jesus said, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John 6, 38. Jesus was in submission to his Father. And then it goes on in that verse we're looking at, and it says, in the fear of Christ, or as I said in the King James, it says, in the fear of God. The fear of the Lord. Now, the fear of the Lord is not frequently preached. That's not a topic you hear often in these days, it seems. Is that true? I mean, when was the last time you went into a, a big church and heard them talking about the fear of the Lord? But think about these words. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs 1, 7. 
The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Proverbs 8, 13. In the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence. Proverbs 14, 26. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Proverbs 14, 20. This is the book of wisdom, right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's in the Psalms. Psalms 111, verse 10. And in the New Testament, Jesus said, it's, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Luke 1, 50. It's about the awe, the reverence of God. Are you seeing a pattern here? Oh, yeah. When Isaiah prophesied of the coming Messiah, the Savior, he said, and I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, talking about the coming Messiah, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. Jesus Christ was operating under the fear of the Lord. Okay? So that's the context of where we're going now, right? It's the foundation. That's the foundation. So now, buckle up and buckle down, because I'm going to read Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Wives, submit. The hairs on your neck going up? Well, not you, I don't know. When Alice and I got married 52 and a half years ago, as of uh, they were filming now, right? She became Mrs. Alan McDaniel. Hooray. Hooray. <laughs> but not too long after that, the culture said that no, but rather she was Mrs. Alice McDaniel. And then with the aggressively growing women's movement, they said she should be called Ms. Alice Bazanda, Bazanda, Bazanda McDaniel, that's her maiden name. In our society today, it is simply not uncommon at all just to forego marriage and just live together. Mm -hmm. Isn't that true? I think even more so in England than it is here in the United States, but here is enough. Now, that's otherwise known throughout, throughout Scripture as the sin of fornication. Absolutely. Living together without that God-given commitment covenant. covenant between each other. Now, culture and morals in the world have changed rapidly and drastically. But we, the family of God, should keep in mind that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and yes forever. And let me go back to Isaiah again. Isaiah said, the grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of our God stands forever. Isaiah 40, verse 8. Submit. Listen, the word's unchanging. Mm -hmm. Culture changes. The word of God does not. Jesus does not. It says, submit to your own husbands. Wives, submit to your own husbands. In former times, the holy women who hoped in God were submissive to their husbands. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what it says. In 1 Peter 3, 6, it says, Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. That's the word of God. Wives, be submissive to your husbands. Period. Giving thanks for them and trusting in the Lord. Period. Trust in the Lord that if they need correcting, he will do it. It's not your job to replace God in that situation or to replace your husband. Remember before you tell me why you don't think that's a good idea. And, and I'll tell you, how, I can't begin to tell you how many times I'm sharing with Christian women and they'll tell me why that's not a good idea. Why, why it's right for them. It's the whole reason for why they can't do it. I don't know if you've ever heard me say this before, but excuses are, are the fiery arrows shot from the pits of hell to kill repentance. You've got to change the way you think. And you have to do this as unto the Lord. Because I have to tell you, if you don't do it, it's the Lord you're being in rebellion to. It is such a blessing to women. It is, to be submissive to husbands. It is. And if the husbands are not in good order, God will deal with that. Right. It's not, wife, it's not your job to deal with that. 
It's your wife to be submitted to them. Your job to be submitted to them. That's the word of God. You can make all the excuses you want. You can say all the good reasons why you think it's all right for you. It is not all right. The word of God is unchanging. All right, so let me go on to the next couple of verses. Ephesians 5, we're going to read verses 23 and 24. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Just, you know, what, whatever you've done to the least of my brethren, you've done to me. I promise you, wife, the way you treat your husband is the way you're treating the Lord. And by the way, I'll now get to this. Husbands, that the inverse of that is true. Maybe even more so. If you don't love your wife in deed and in fact and in action, you're going to have to deal with the one who owns her or who bought her. The husband, it says, is the head of the wife. So in Exodus 13, 18, it says this. Hence God led the people around by the way of the wilderness to the Red Sea. And the sons of Israel went up in martial array from the land of Egypt. This is, you know, when God had delivered them, using the hand of Moses to deliver them out of Egypt. And then at the Red Sea, by the way, I think today as we're filming, Passover is starting this year, right? Uh, what year is it? 2020? 2020. Yeah. I, I just want to have a little interruption here to say to my Jewish friends, and I have a lot of Jewish friends, as you celebrate Passover, understand that what took place, and I'm going to talk about that right now, God calls rebellion. What the people did, what God did was magnificent. What God did needs to be remembered, recounted, and broadcast. What they did at the Red Sea. But what they did at the Red Sea was not a good thing. Okay. Because remember, at, at, at the Red Sea, the people of God, what did they do? They mumbled and grumbled and groaned and complained. What did I say? As we said, here's, here's the context. Give thanks. Give thanks in all things. Give thanks for all things. We're not do all things without grumbling and complaining. That's the word of God. That's the context of this. So at the Red Sea, the people of God mumbled and grumbled and groaned and complained and wished that they were back where they started. We would have been better off than Egypt. Egypt. Yeah, if you'd love to say so Moses spoke to them and said, Stand still and see the salvation of God. The Lord parted the waters, and they passed through the Red Sea, but the Egyptians could not. They were swallowed up. That sounds wonderful. And that's a good part of what being remembered in the Passover. But let me just read you another scripture from the Psalms. This is from Psalm 106. Verse 7, our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember your abundant kindnesses, but rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. If you mumble and grumble and groan and complain, you're in rebellion. Wife, if you grumble and mumble, groan and complain about your husband, you are in rebellion, in rebellion to God. This is the word of God. I'm not going to change it for you, and you can't change it for yourself. And remember this, because the word of God says that rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. 1 Samuel 15, 23. You want to be in rebellion to God? Well, if you're in rebellion to your husband, you're in rebellion to God. You have to trust in God with all your heart. You have to give thanks for all things. And one of the things that I'm thinking about, too, is that if you're having a problem and you go to somebody else and you're telling them all the things oh, that's worse. doing wrong, you're gossiping. That's gossip. That's gossip. And they, they can't accomplish anything. Whoever you speak to, the only one that can accomplish and change the person is If you can't find something good in your husband to boast about, what'd you marry him for? Yeah. How did you get into this relationship in the first place? You should be, I mean, go read the end of the book of Proverbs. Re read the 31st chapter of the book of Proverbs. You should be boasting in your husband. Boasting the things that you can boast about. 
Pray, pray for him. Right. Pray for God to bless him. Wives ought to be subject, submitted to their husbands in everything. That's the word of God. That's what we're just reading here in the scripture. So now, listen, I know that it doesn't always seem to work right. I mean, you know, the way the world does it, the way it happens in your life. But you have to either believe the word or not believe the word. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 3, and he said, In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. They're not going to be won by you mumbling, grumbling, and complaining and speaking evil of them. Not going to happen. In the garden, now remember, in the garden, Adam and the woman, she didn't even get her own name, Eve, until after the fall and after she had been kicked out of the garden. She had no identity of her own. She was part and parcel of Adam. They were one. They were one. God created them, male and female, man created them, right? She rebelled against both Adam, for whatever reason, Adam went along for the ride. Shame on him. But God deal with him. It's not her job to deal with him. But the sin was accounted to him. Sin entered the world through Adam. Right? He's, he was held responsible. He was held responsible. And husbands, you'll be held responsible. Yeah. It caused division. When, when, that, when that sin happened, it caused division, first of all, between the man and the woman. Mm -hmm. It caused division between the man and the woman and God. I mean, isn't that what it says? In Genesis 3, 8, it says this. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the tree of the garden, trees of the garden. When God shows up, are you going to hide yourself from him? Is that your desire? You're going to run and hide? Or are you going to run to him? Well, if you don't have a right relationship with him, chances are good you're going to want to hide. The man said, then said in Genesis 3.12, this is, he's talking to God and he says, he says to God, the woman that you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. In other words, the woman's, it's her fault and it's your fault because you gave her to me. Everybody's fault but his. Did you ever notice that in human beings, fallen human beings? And when something goes wrong, we just, we blame everybody in sight except for ourselves, right? You might as well get a great big sign that says out of order and hang it somewhere, hang it around your neck. Uh -huh. Your wife may say, you don't know how hard it is. You don't know my husband. You don't know how hard it is for me to submit to him. Poor baby. <laughs> you think it's hard? I, I, I'm sure that sometimes it feels hard to, to do. Of course it does. Yeah. Submission is not, it's not easy. So you think that's hard? Let me read the next verse, Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives. That doesn't sound hard. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Men, we have to die. That's right. She's got to make a dinner you don't feel like having. You got to die. That's hard. I'm telling you the truth. I, I, really, stop and think about it. You women, you think it's hard for you to submit to... No, it's really what it, what the hardness is is for men to love you the way Christ did, and they have to, they need to, and they are able to. You know why? Because the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. You are called to give up your life for us. Absolutely, the husbands are to give up their life for the. Wife. Absolutely, you know. A few years ago, you know, we we travel about um, preaching and teaching, and we were in Ireland. And we were in uh, Strokestown, Roscom in Ireland. Mm. And there was a group there, and they had asked me to come and speak. And, and they asked if I would come and speak about men, what it means to act like men. Right? Because it says, be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. We, we need to do that. We need, 
It takes strength to do that. And we don't have that strength. It's the power of the Holy Spirit within us. Well, you know, I started the context of this was Jesus. He didn't want to do that. No, no. It wasn't his natural desire no. to do it. He said, but nevertheless, thy will be done. Yes. So guys, no, it doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter what you want to do. It matters what you need to do, what you ought to do, what God desires you to do. And that requires truly putting your will under, not your wife's, but putting your will under the Lord's. Submitting to God. Hallelujah. And all I can say about that is, she's worth it. <laughs> okay. So anyhow, I, I, they asked me, uh, was at this prayer meeting there in Russia, Stroke Sound. And there was this group that got together a couple of times a week, and they asked if I'd come and do a teaching. And the women all got excited and asked if I'd do a teaching, teach the men how to be men. Mm -hmm. So I did. I did a teaching on men acting like men and showed the women how dependent it was on them being faithful to the Lord. Okay, but that's another story. The reason for this, like I said, God does everything for a purpose. There's a purpose in everything he does, everything he tells us to do. The purpose of all of this is, speaking of the husband, that he might sanctify her. This is Jesus sanctifying his bride, having cleansed her by the washing of water and with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Christ is coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. And that's so important. We're going to talk about that in our next, uh, our next session next week. So I pray that you'll join us in. And Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for your word. I especially thank you for your word who is made flesh and dwelt among us. Yes. Because Lord, not only did he tell us what to do, but he showed us how to do it. He lived it, he lived it, he lived it. We thank you for the gift of your son, Christ Jesus. We thank you for the gift of your love. Because without the love that you've poured into our hearts, we could do nothing. So, Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. And I pray that by that love and by that grace and by the spirit of your spirit that dwells within us, that we would live your word. And we would do it in a way, Lord, with the power of that Holy Spirit that glorifies you. It is a testimony and a testament to your work in our lives. We just praise you and thank you in Jesus' name, Father. All right. Well, until next week, God bless you. Live it. Amen. Live it. Choose to live it. You don't have to like it, but you got to live it. God bless you and goodbye till next week. Oh